So I'm the department chief research biologist based out of Anchorage. Um, a couple of my ADF and G colleagues also graciously agreed to show up tonight, uh, and I'll just take a minute and introduce them. Uh, we've got Lem Butler over here on the far side. Lem is the regional supervisor for the Palmer-based region, uh, Region 4. Moving back this way is Chris Brockman in the khaki shirt. Chris is a research biologist out of Palmer and spends a lot of time organizing the survey, the sheep survey and census efforts out of the Palmer office. Todd Rinaldi right here in the black jacket is the area management biologist out of Palmer and I invited a couple of our other colleagues and if they straggle in we'll, we'll introduce them but we'll all stick around. Excuse me, Mark Birch is another research biologist and Tim Peltier out of, uh, out of Palmer is here as well. We'll stick around here at the end of the talk and uh, if you guys want to get into some in-depth discussions, we'll be happy to happy to do that. The other thing that I want to make clear from the get-go, this is super informal. So if you come up with a question, um, I would just as soon have you ask it right away during the course of the talk. That way we can get to it and uh, <clears throat> have, some, have some good discussion during the talk. Just raise your hand, shout it out, whatever. I'm not going to get hung up on it. And... We're here all night, or at least I am. I can't speak for these guys, but I'm willing to stay as long as it takes. So with that, we'll get going. Um, let's see. Not yet. Before I get going, the other thing that I really, really, really need to point out, uh, my name is on this, but this is very much a collaborative effort. There have been several people throughout the department, in and out of the department, members of the public, hunters that have provided some very valuable insight and given very generously their time and effort to make this thing happen. So I get to stand up here and talk about it. The credit is by far not all mine. It's very much a collaborative effort. And I'll take a minute at the end of the talk to mention these folks because they've, they've really, really uh, made it happen. <clears throat> All I did was, was kind of put the group together and, and put the ball in motion. The other thing that I need to point out before we get rolling, uh, I spent about five years now working in game management unit 13D between the Matanuska and the Taslina glaciers. So, well, the 13D study area, I'll talk about that specifically in a minute. We've only spent about two years now working in 14C. We started that project a little later with some similar but not identical goals. So keep in mind that we've got a pretty good picture about what's going on demographically in the Game Management Unit 13D study area. But as far as 14C goes, we're dealing with two years of data. We've had two very weird winters. The winter of 2011-2012, as you remember, was a record snowfall year. And then last winter did some interesting things toward the end of the winter. So don't jump to conclusions. Do not compare the data sets at this point. I think down the road we'll be able to do that. But right now we're just looking at two years of data from 14C. And <clears throat> I'm not quite willing to say... By gosh, this is what's happening in 14C. We've got some pretty good indications, but we're not a, we're not 100% yet. So the other thing is, is that some of these analyses are not complete. I'm running some numbers even right now, and that the values might change a little bit. These are ballpark numbers. If I say we've got 27% lamb mortality and such and such, it might go up or down a couple of percentage points. The big picture on the story won't change, and I'm comfortable presenting that, but or presenting the data as it sits, but you know, 27, 28, 26, whatever, it's in that ballpark. So think of these as comparisons, think of these as relative numbers. We'll come out with we'll come out with a final report on the project down the road and, and uh, make sure everybody gets a copy of that probably in the next oh year to two years. But values should be considered approximate on all these numbers I'm giving you. <clears throat> hey Brian. Oh, I, I can live without it. No worries. I can live without it. We'll just... Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll run for you. So we started this project in 2009. I was hired in August of 2008 as a sheep researcher. Uh, up till that point, we had had exactly six, maybe seven radio callers on sheep in south central Alaska. Rick Sinnott had... Uh, put a couple out around Eklutna Lake in the 80s and early 90s, and mostly for tracking animals, but we didn't have any real good demographic pictures. We knew that we'd had a declining sheep population. In fact, that's why we picked the study area. 
area biologist Bob Toby, formerly of the Glen Allen area office, had a, made a valiant effort, despite a bunch of de depleted funding in the 1980s and 90s, to maintain census work on this particular study area. So we were able to document that we'd had a population decline in the 13D study area, which was the main reason we picked it. We know that the population had gone from 650 or 700 animals down to a low of 350 or 400-ish in the 2007-2009 range. The interesting thing about this is that up until 05, 06, the declines in the RAM and the U component of the population were very, very parallel, uh, very similar declines. And that suggested to us very strongly that this was not a hunting-related issue, that there was something else, bigger picture going on. So those were the two reasons, two of the primary reasons we picked the 13D study area. We had good hard census numbers, <clears throat> and we knew that it probably wasn't a hunting situation. With that, we wanted to establish a baseline demographic picture. We'll go out and fly our surveys in July. We'll go out and buzz around, count sheep. We'll come up with a number. We'll say, okay, we've got 30 lambs per 100 ewes in such and such a population. Now, up until this point, we didn't know how we got there. We don't know if 100 ewes were given birth to 100 lambs, if 30 of them or 70 of them were getting whacked, or we didn't know if they were nutritionally stressed and 100 ewes were given birth to 30 lambs and every one of those lambs was surviving. We had no idea. So we had the number, but we didn't really know how we were getting there. At this point, um, at this point in time, or at that point in time rather, there was a fairly big effort to initiate some predator control to benefit our declining sheep populations. So we were interested in informing that process prior to starting the project. <clears throat> I built this project around the question, what is driving sheep population trends in South Central Alaska? Um, specifically, we wanted to look at pregnancy rates, recruitment rates, all of the several different rates and all of the several different causes of death in sheep, rates of mortality, what's causing the death, how many are dying because of it, and disease. We'd heard some reports, I'll get to that in a little bit, we'd heard some reports of dead sheep in certain areas and were concerned, uh, as if you follow the sheep literature, that we were in a similar situation as the lower 48, where you might have 70-80% of a herd dying off due to pneumonia. So those were the big four. Um, <clears throat> Things got a little more specific, but uh, I'll discuss that in a moment. So the study area up in 13D is bounded on the east side by the Taslina Glacier, on the west by the Matanuska, on the south by the ice cap, and the north pretty much by the lowlands along the Matanuska River. Um, the other big advantage, of course, is that we've got Mike Meekin's place right there off the south fork of the Matanuska, and we were able to base off of Mike's strip. So logistically, this was a piece of cake place to build the project. Um, <clears throat> had road access to our base, and, and at one point in the project, we could hear the radio signals on about, oh, about a third of our callers right from the runway at, uh, at Mike's place. That'll give you an idea of the study area. Again, I'm going to bounce back. This will be easy for me because everybody's familiar with our game management unit system here. When I give this talk in other locations or to uh, less of a sheep hunting crowd, people are like, 13 what? But uh, you guys can keep this straight. So 13D, northern study area. <clears throat> Not working. Okay. <clears throat> And I'll talk briefly about 14C. Um, 14C was a little bit of a different case, but we'd had a cyclic sheep population. We'd hovered around 900-ish animals through the 70s, bumped up around 2,000 at the peak, similar to uh, right around Y2K, and then descended back down to 900 or 1,100 sheep by 2007, 2011. Again, the trajectory, trajectory of the population was very similar between the RAM and the U component. Um, <clears throat> this project was two parallel but not identical goals to the 13D study. First off, I wanted to ask if the driving factors in the 14C Chugach were similar to those in the northern part of the range. Could we generalize across different study areas? Could we generalize across South Central Alaska? Um, there's some very different, some very major distinctions drawn between what we'd seen in the Alaska range and the Brooks and what we're seeing in the Chugach. And I wanted to know if the trends we were seeing would be uh, would be consistent South Central wide. Can we use this data to manage other populations in South Central Alaska? The secondary project goal was to look at the rates and causes of mortality in three to eight year old rams. What happens on these rams that are too young to be uh, too young to be hunted, too small to be hunted, 
under the full curl harvest reg? Well, we don't really know. Most of the mortality data on those animals was from horn pickups. And we hear people say, well, we don't really find smaller rams. And that's true, but those are smaller horns. So maybe they get carried off, maybe they rot, whatever. And well, at the same time, we wanted to be able to pick up some, uh, some information on dispersal, where they're moving to, where they're coming from, where they're going, some of their behavior. So this was a really good opportunity to get a little bit more information. <clears throat> 14C study area, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It's your backyard. Uh, the northern end of the range is go or the northern end of the study area, rather, is Goat Creek. The south end is the is, is Ship. And I deliberately didn't deploy anything, any collars south of Ship Creek. I wanted to keep collared animals off of the Turnigan Arm. Wildlife viewing area, that was a a decision on my part just to try to keep those those sheep that were readily visible um, out of the out of the way. We had one move down there, and the rest of it was logistics. We can work off of birchwood, we can work off of merrill, and everything's in a fairly discreet little little spot. <clears throat> so I mentioned we were going to look into four major pictures or four major questions. First was weather. We know anecdotally from our survey reports, uh, talking to hunters, talking to members of the public that are interested in sheep, in years with wet, heavy spring snow, we often see a decreased lamb crop. There was some concern about ice formation, warmer, wetter winters maybe leading to heavier snowpacks so that, that animals couldn't crater through and forage. We know from some previous work done in the Alaska Range by a colleague of mine named Steve Arthur, who worked out of our Fairbanks office until this year. Uh, Steve has retired and moved over to the Park Service. He's still working on sheep, but he's in Denali National Park. Steve did a project in the Alaska Range from 1999 to 2003 and showed that about 90% of the lambs that were killed died from predators. We'll talk in depth about this a little bit more. But keep this number in mind. Uh, in the Alaska Range project, this is Dry Creek, south of Fairbanks, on the north slope of the Alaska Range. About 90% of the lambs that he worked over a four-year period, excuse me, of the lambs that died, over a four-year period, about 90% were killed by predators. Coyotes and eagles were the major players in that, uh, in that, in that population. <clears throat> the other really interesting thing that Steve came up with was that 100%, every single adult that died on that project was killed by predators over a four-year period. Wolves were the big players there. Bears and wolverines, not so much. As I mentioned, we were talking about doing some predator control in, uh, in sheep in South Central, and this we wanted to see if the same thing was happening in South Central before we went full scale with a or before we went forward with a predator control effort. Overall, Steve reported a 22% lamb survival rate to one year. Um, <clears throat> not unusual for an ungulate population. Some moose populations will dip into the single digits, as will some caribou. Uh, but it's just a good place to start. So we wanted to look at weather and predation. Go ahead and next slide for me. The other couple things that we wanted to look at, my background is nutritional physiology. Um, I was trained as a physiologist looking at how animals deal with rough winter conditions. And we know from a lot of other work that mineral deficiencies have caused decreased pregnancy rates in bighorn populations down south. And we know that malnutrition, in some cases, has also caused decreased pregnancy rates and decreased productivity and low recruitment rates. <clears throat> the final picture or the final piece of the puzzle we wanted to investigate was disease. Uh, as I mentioned, Pneumonia has wiped out or heavily hit, I guess both, both terms are accurate, several populations in the lower 48 recently, if you've been reading the news, you'll see a, a pneumonia outbreak and that will lose 70 to 90 percent of that population and then going forward from there they'll have a very, very decreased pregnancy and productivity uh, scenario. <clears throat> so those were the four big picture things that we wanted to ask. Remember, up until this point, we knew nothing about what was creating our sheep populations here. So this was very much a baseline demographic study. And we, the department as a whole had moved away from sheep work in the mid to, mid to late 80s and early 90s uh, as money was tight and uh, caribou and moose, <clears throat> excuse me, caribou and moose were driving the, the, big, the big interest. <clears throat> Go ahead, Brian. Thanks. So we start our research here in March and April. In fact, I start flying next week, capturing adults. And uh, <clears throat> go ahead, next one. Before we get too deep into this, I want to mention that this is an incredibly stressful event from the for the animal. Um, it, 
In some instances, it's possible to do a lot of damage to animals when you're catching them. It's not all wild kingdom. You know, we all start as wildlife biologists, and we think it's really clean. You fire the dart at the animal, it falls over, it goes to sleep. You give it the reversal, it comes right back up, and it runs off. It's not entirely true. Um, a good friend of mine, one of my one of my researchers, one of my research colleagues and good friend, has said that the further into this career you get, the less you like immobilizing and capturing animals. It's really true. The more we learn, the harder it is. So we had to keep that in mind. Um, to, in order to, because this was a decreasing population, I was pretty concerned that we not do any further damage. I set up some fairly stringent standards for animal care. First off, <clears throat> we keep our helicopter chase times to a maximum of three minutes. Uh, it turns out in a lot of other populations, you chase animals a long time, they get hot, they're subject to a number of metabolic syndromes or conditions that can, can kill them. Um, <clears throat> we kept our chase time to a hard ceiling of three minutes. So the, from the instant that that animal started moving or responding to the helicopter, the clock was ticking. If we didn't get it caught in three minutes, we'd abort and move on to another animal. The second thing that we would do would be to keep our total handling time, the time we were stressing that animal, to a 20-minute ceiling, including our chase. So basically, from the time that animal starts responding to the helicopter, we've got a hard ceiling of 20 minutes before we're absolutely done. When that, when we hit that, when that clock ticks down, that's it. And it's time to move on. Um, the other thing is, is uh, we very carefully monitor animal body temperature when they get hot and they get stressed. Their temperature gets above 106. By the way, their normal temperature is 100 to 101. They're run a little bit warmer than we do, but 106 and above is, is kind of the danger zone. Actually, 107 is the danger zone, uh, so we wanted to make sure we had a hard ceiling at 106. Anything above 106 is caused to stop the workup and release the animal immediately. <clears throat> I think it's worked out. We've handled a few over, a few more than 200 sheep to date, and I've had three documented capture mortalities. I'm pretty, pretty comfortable with this. Um, so, video. yeah, let's go to that first video. And before we start this, I'll point out that it looks like there's a the capture compilation, not the lamb capture one. Before we before we start this, I'll point out that it looks like there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts, but pay attention to what that animal is doing before we put the net on it. In most cases, we're trying to turn it uphill and slow it down. Um, wait for it to, to hit a spot where it's going to land on snow, and uh, that's all right. There it is. There. Okay. All right, let me. <clears throat> so keep an eye on the animal, and uh, even though it looks like there's a lot going on, this is actually a very, very controlled situation. <clears throat> what we're doing right now is trying to move this animal down out of the rocks, and she's down at the down at the base. We're trying to get her to move into a an old avalanche chute out onto the debris pile, so that we can get a uh, get a net over. Her. And you can see the animal's moving across the bottom of the avalanche chute. And just as she starts to go uphill, we'll put the net over the top of her. And this way we don't, we try really hard not to net them at full speed. Once they've moved uphill, they slow down fairly substantially, and there's much, much lower chance of breaking a leg or breaking a neck. <clears throat> We're good for about 15 yards. Uh, it's pretty, pretty close range. This is a ram capture, and... Uh, <clears throat> Same kind of thing. We'll move these animals just a little bit farther than you might think. Can you guys see okay? Okay. <laughs> but again, pay attention to what that animal is doing right before we put the net on it. You'll see it hauling across the hillside. The helicopter pulls in front of it very, very slowly. We've got a few minutes or a few seconds in the chase yet. The helicopter pulls in front of the animal very slowly and gets it to turn uphill. So it's not running flat out. It's actually slowing down quite a bit. So right about here, we've got good separation between the two animals, not a factor, no, no stress on the, limited stress on the other animal. And as he stops and turns uphill, we get a net on him. <laughs> yeah, we, we, also, we also pay pretty close attention to what they're landing in. Soft snow is great and really, really saves us. 
chase time. Uh, does that make a difference with what's chasing them or what you're chasing them? I think they get a lot more stress from the helicopter. Uh, it's it's a it's an incredibly stressful event for the animal, and uh, I think I think the helicopter is just nothing they've ever experienced. So I would <clears throat> the the three cases of mortality. What were the causes on that? Um, I broke a leg. I uh, had an animal moving across a gravelly slope. Thought it was a perfect situation. Netted it. Um, got up to it. Actually, we had the video. We had the video rolling. Um, Got up to it, netted it, did the workup, and started to look around. If, after we finished the workup, can we do a quick, just overall overall assessment? She had a broken leg, and I I'm not sure if she got it wrapped in a net and stumbled on it, uh, if she got stepped on or what. But the the lower the lower part of her right hind leg was broken. Um, we euthanized it right there and brought the carcass out for for whole body analysis. Um, I had one fall. I was getting a little too big for my britches in terms of the location in which I could capture. Um, <clears throat> that actually brings up a good point. Um, had an animal I thought I could keep location control on, and she got away from me and went down over about a 1,000 feet of cliff band. Um, <clears throat> and the other one, um, the other one I don't know exactly. We, we caught her. She was a little bit warm. She was in that 105, that 105 high range. Let her go. She ran off, looked good. And uh, a week later, we, she turned up dead. Um, the carcass had been scavenged, but our our internal policy is that anything within 30 days of capture counts as a capture mortality. So we're we're going to err on the side of caution in in that instance. And I couldn't; she'd been scavenged, so I couldn't get the carcass into a pathologist for a necropsy. But I I'm fairly confident that it was a, a capture mort. Do you want the other video here? No, we'll back. get to that in a second. Brian asked a good question about location and stuff. One other point to make. Uh, I actually made the choice pretty early on in the project not to use immobilizing drugs. We're not darting. We're netting, as you've noticed. We're physically restraining these animals. I think this gives us a lot more leeway. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, if anybody's ever had surgery, you know, you're, you're messed up for 24 to 48 hours afterwards. You're not quite right. Uh, <clears throat> so by not using immobilizing drugs, we're just we're physically restraining. We're hobbling them. We're blindfolding them. And uh, I think they maintain their thermoregular thermal regulatory control a little bit better and we also don't mess with their gut motility which is really critical in a four-chambered stomached animal like a like a ruminant uh, we keep all that stuff moving so <clears throat> i think we're giving a we're, we're erring on the side of caution it might be a little more stressful during the capture event they don't just you know they don't just lay down but uh but there's less long term on the animal the other real advantage is location control. It usually takes between four and seven minutes, depending on the dose per body weight and the dart location, for that drug to take effect when you dart an animal. For moose, we often plan on five to ten minutes in between the dart and when the animal lays down to where we can get a collar on it and work it up. And, of course, I'm sure you can imagine what would happen if you gave a sheep five minutes to run in sheep country and uh, they can get themselves into all kinds of trouble. So the net gun is a, is a choice. Uh, I think it's a, a, a safer choice for the animal, and, and uh, there's a few other complications, but it, overall it's a good bet. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> uh, these are pictures from a video camera that was mounted on the side, and I just include them in the talk in case for some reason the video doesn't work. So you can scroll right through those. You see the net deployment. Um, <clears throat> before I get too much further, before I get ahead of myself, this is our net gun. This is a... Basically, picture a Remington 700 bolt action that's sawed off about two inches in front of the firing pin and then a manifold welded to it. Uh, it fires a 308 caliber blank, and the blank, the gas from the blank goes into the forearms of the manifold, and the net has heavy metal weights on all four corners with a low ring. So the power, the, the gas propulsion from the blank blows the, blows the, uh, <clears throat> blows the weights out, and the weights carry the net with it. I've pulled the bolt out so nobody can, if you happen to have a 308 round in your pocket, it won't do any good. But uh, I'll pass this around. And there's a 10 foot by 10 foot nylon spectra net. John? Uh, it's both 13D and 14A. Yeah, between the, between the two study areas, we've handled a little bit north of 200 animals. Okay, um, <clears throat> so once we get the animal down, restrained, we get it out of the net. Go back one, would you? Um, this is my graduate student, Brianne Winter, now Bowen, and she's pulling this U out of the net. You can see here we've got leather hobbles on, on both feet. Basically, you hobble the right side front to back, left side front to back, and then uh, <clears throat> both sides together. 
pop a blindfold on them and get them back, uh, get them back vertical. And they, they tend to, to settle right down once you get that blindfold on them. Go ahead, next slide. They're fitted with a radio collar. Go ahead. And we take a quick blood sample. Go ahead. Uh, here's a here's Bree working up a, a small ram up in the upper reaches of Peters Creek. Go ahead, next one. And uh, finally, in some cases, they get a get a GPS collar. Uh, I'll hand these collars around. You can get an idea of what they're wearing. The black one is a GPS collar. There's no magic to the color that just lets us tell the individual. But there's a GPS receiver here. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out is that these are fitted with an automatic release mechanism. This little black thing here is a is a basically a little solenoid. At the, the release date, it pops and the collar comes off. So we fit them with these just to ensure that they don't uh, don't wear the collars into eternity. <clears throat> there we go. Oh, we've got we've got collars in the 13D study area that are still good that were deployed in the first capture in March of 2009. They're still pinging away. I think the company guarantees them for four years. What, guys, my four years? But um, in a lot of cases, we'll get six or eight out of them. Are you intentional at all about, with, with your rams that you color, do you intentionally choose ones that are a little bit younger so that they're not likely to be targeted by hunters? Yes. Companies? Yeah, I've got, I've got north of $1,000 a helicopter time sure. plus a $3,000 radio collar feed, or GPS collar on each animal. And um, <clears throat> so up to, up to this point, I have deliberately collared sublegal um, two to six-year-old rams and nothing, uh, nothing bigger than three-quarter curl. Uh, just to just to give us a couple of years window and, and uh, try to stay away from the any potential conflict and then the animals released uh, <clears throat> okay next slide and we uh, I'm, I'm kind of a cheapskate actually the, the these are all everything I'm deploying is store on board so we've got to re we've got to recover the collar at the end of the at the end of the project, which is another reason for the for the automatic detach, um, <clears throat> there are some these the the black collar that we're handing around is about twenty two or twenty three hundred bucks worth of collar right now. The ones that you can actually download sitting at your desk are about four grand, and I just as soon save the fifteen hundred bucks and and use it in time to get into the field and look at the animals, learn a little bit more about the the habitat, and see what's going on. But the more on the ground time I can get, the better. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. What's your average? About 19. <laughs> we're, we're pushing it pretty hard, Lauren. Um, we've, we're, we're getting to the point where if everything goes really well, we're at, we're at 17, 16, 17 minutes. Um, but in a, in a situation where something goes a little crossways, you don't, um, you don't get the animal out of the net with the, the dexterity that you would like. Um, things happen pretty fast. So in, We've got the we've got the workup set, so we take the data we need first. You know, we prioritize what we got to get first and move down the priority list from there. So if we have to cut something loose, it's it's doable. So what's last on the priority list? Uh, fecal samples. So. Yes. Yeah. It's it's actually that's a that's a neat question, Lou. Uh, rams are a completely different animal from ewes. Catching catching ewes is is fairly straightforward. Rams always know where the escape train is and they're always trying to get there. Um, once you can once you can get a U kind of down and body weighted, um, you generally you have the fight have the fight pretty well won. But most of the most of the rams that we work and granted I have not worked a lot. We're you know, we're in the oh, I think we're in the realm of 30, 35 total rams handled on the project out of two hundred and some. But uh, every ram I've handled has been very, very different. They know how to use their weight, and and uh, I keep my flight helmet on during during the workups. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so anyway, so we've been we've maintained about forty animals radio collared in the 13D study area uh, every year since 2009, and we try to capture each of those animals individually. This is a lot of stress on the animal. In this case, I feel that the data is worth it. We're looking at. Um, Getting blood and fecal samples to check for disease. We're doing it both a nasal and a throat swab to uh, to look for any traces of pneumonia. Uh, we're looking at a quick body condition assessment, actually trying to measure the distance between the underlying bony structures and the muscle beds. You can actually feel. Uh, <clears throat> we'll get into the details a little bit later, but feel the distance between the top of the backbone and the top of the back strap. Uh, it's actually a fairly good indicator of how much protein they've been 
using over the course of the over the course of the winter how nutritionally stressed they are. And some of the blood that we use goes to a pregnancy test on these on these females. <clears throat> 14C is much the same. We started the project in March of 2012, handling 35 adult ewes, and then uh, 19 rams between the ages of 3 and 6 to start the project. Uh, the ewes all got VHF collars. The collars just go beep, beep, beep. Uh, the rams got GPS collars so we could look at movement, rates of dispersal, where they were going, where they were coming from, what they were doing. And pretty much the same workup. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, we're getting one every six hours. I was looking for kind of long-term movement rather than real fine-scale stuff. So we picked up one one location every six hours for two years. So we've still got most of them out there in the field. We had a couple release unexpectedly this summer and have them, have them recovered. But <clears throat> Let me uh, – okay, we're going to – we're going to – Shift back and forth now that we're getting into the meat of the talk. We're going to start talking about some of the some of the results and what we've seen. So I'm going to trust you guys to follow me on the 13D versus 14C stuff. And if you get um, you get confused, stop me. Or if I'm going too fast, stop me, and we'll we'll go slow. 13D. I'll put this slide in just to remind us we're going back up north. Go ahead, Brian. The first thing that we noticed, we started handling these animals in March of 2009, was that they were very, very skinny. Body condition appeared very poor, even for animals in late winter. Qualitatively, we'd put them at a 1 or a 2 on a 0 through 5 scale, with 5 being butterball and 0 being dead. Uh, these guys were in the, in the 1 to 2 range. <clears throat> Interestingly, every animal we handled was completely and totally devoid of subcutaneous fat. Uh, you could run your hand from the neck down the spine, across the withers, down across the pelvis. You can feel every single bony structure in that animal. Uh, <clears throat> there's as much as a centimeter of distance between the top of the, the spine and the longissimus dorsi, the back strap. You know, when you're taking that muscle off there, off of them in August or September, it's pretty much flush with the top of the backbone. You might have just a little... Um, just a little distance between there, but it's riding pretty high. By the by, the time late winter rolls around, there's you know there's the end of your thumb, even more between the top of the spine and the top of the back strap. Now, here's where it gets interesting for me as a biologist. Talk to my colleague Steve in Fairbanks. Steve handled a bunch of animals in the Brooks and in the Alaska Range. Um, the Alaska Range study, remember, was 1999 to 2003. His Brooks Range study was oh gosh, I think. 2009, 2008, 2009 to 2011, every single animal he handled up there was carrying sub-Q fat, was really well muscled. So this was the first real big divergent thing that we observed. Um, was he also handling those annually? Yes, yeah. So this it's actually a really good point, but yes. Um, go ahead. Okay. The second thing that came out was that our pregnancy rate was quite a bit lower than we expected. Our first year, 2009, we saw a 62% pregnancy rate in our three-year-old ewes and older. Um, most ungulate populations usually hang in that range 85%, and we've got good data on several different sheep populations saying that 85 to up to 100% is fairly normal. Again, we're going to compare to Steve Arthur's Alaska range data set from 99 to 03. In four years, Steve had ranges in the 85 to 100 percent range. He had one bad year. His worst year up there over four years was 78 percent. Okay, keep that figure in mind. <clears throat> um, a colleague, Mari Wood, who's uh, employed by the BC Ministry of Environment, did a five-year project on stone sheep wrapping up in 2012. She had collars on 50 animals over a five-year period. She had a between a 95 and 100 percent pregnancy rate on those animals every year. So this 62% was like, ooh, hey, something's going on. Better take a look at this. We followed that up in 2010 with a slightly higher, back to more a normal range for ungulates. Then it dropped again in 2011. Dropped very, very substantially in 2012, all the way down to 21%. An asterisk there is just to remind me to tell you that this is the lowest pregnancy rate I've recorded in any ungulate population. I've seen recorded in any ungulate population anywhere. This was really, really interesting. Um, not great, not good, but interesting. <clears throat> we saw a bit of a rebound effect in 2013. So <clears throat> we'll just let that sit for a minute. Go ahead on to the next slide, please. And this is to speak to the disease question. Um, we ran an extensive disease workup for all of the bacterial players that have been associated with pneumonia in lower 48 sheep populations, as well as a suite of viral diseases that we know affect sheep. Long story short, <clears throat> there are 
I'm going to... I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a disease person. There are really, really good minds working on the sheep disease issue in the lower 48. The synopsis is this. There are two families of bacteria that cause this lethal big picture pneumonia in sheep. Um, one of them is thought to be naturally occurring. The sheep's defenses typically keep that out of the sheep's lungs. There's another bacteria that at this point most researchers suspect they get from domestic animals that comes in and wipes out the natural defenses in the sheep's airway. Then they're able to inhale that other bacteria which naturally occurs in their system. All sheep everywhere so far have it. Once that bacteria gets into the lungs, it grows up big and, and, and kills them. So we've isolated the one, which is naturally occurring, no big deal. Uh, but we haven't gotten the other, which is thought to occur only in cases of contact with domestic animals. So, so far, so good. Um, we also came up with a complete zero on, on any of the viral players we were looking for. So that was good news. Okay. Shift gears and talk about... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Correct. Is that over the entire five years? Correct. We actually... I cheaped out in the middle of the project. We, we collected... The first two years, 2009 and 2010, we ran a complete disease workup. Um, I didn't collect... Back, I didn't collect the disease stuff in 2011, ran it in 2012 and 2013. But we have not gotten any indication that there's a big scale problem. Um, it was 37 in the views. I was 37 the first time around and um, I, 33 to 40 in subsequent years. Uh, but no sample size issues there for sure. I'm very confident with that one. Switch gears, we'll talk about the 14C population. Go ahead. <clears throat> Real similar, these sheep were skinny. Uh, they weren't quite as skinny as the 13D animals. Uh, again, these guys were in a little bit better shape. Um, didn't have any sub-Q fat, and you could run your fingers down their back. And in this case, there was as much as half a centimeter of, of distance between the top of the back strap and the, the top of the spine. Um, we did manage to weigh a couple, although as you can imagine, weighing, sh weighing sheep in sheep country isn't the easiest thing to do. Um, and the 14C animals are, in fact, a little bit bigger. Um, I think we got six or seven weighed in 13D. Those animals are right around 115 to 120 pounds, and the 14C animals are in that 125 to 130 range. Granted, it's a small number, but the you can uh, when you start putting your excuse me, shouldn't have those nachos, Chris. That was uh, <clears throat> that was bad. Um, you start putting your hands on them, you can tell the difference. Yeah, we actually didn't run any. I have not yet caught adult or uh, caught rams in 13D, uh, so I can't I can't speak to the condition of rams in the 13 study area. But all the all the rams we handled were 14C, but they were in in similar condition. We'd expect rams to be in a little bit worse shape than the ewes midwinter, just because of the demands of the rut. Um, so I'm I'm more inclined to look at the U data as a as an indicator of nutritional status in the population rather than than what the rams are doing. I'm, I'm willing to believe the rams will run themselves ragged. Um, <clears throat> we have not, no. And again, we were bumping up against our 20-minute ceiling, and, and uh, you've, you've met Bree, the, the two of us trying to lift a, lift a ram on the, the handle of a snowshoe or a snow shovel would be uh, a, bit, a bit challenging. So I'd like to, and, and it's one of those lesser important things that seems to get prioritized out. So... Uh, we just we just haven't gotten there. The, at, when we when we built the project, that wasn't the information I wanted to get at that time. We were more concerned about what was killing sheep, and we were more we were more looking at the productive segment of the population, the, the ewes and the lambs. So given the uh, given the the we're working with about <laughs> we're working with about one hundred and sixty to one hundred and eighty thousand dollar operational budget on each project. So given that scale, I just couldn't afford to couldn't afford to catch rams for a piece of information we didn't need that badly. I've got to be pretty pretty fiscally responsible. It's something I'd like to get, uh, but it's one of those down the road kind of things. Bob, where does your funding come from? We are in, we are exclusively funded by Pittman Robertson funds. So the everybody out there that bought a hunting license, thank you. Uh, this is all money that we get from. Basically, the state the state takes in money um, from license sales. When you go out and buy ammunition or firearms, what have you, there's a tax on that. That goes to the federal government. The Fish and Wildlife Service administers that, and they 
they dole that out to the states, and they match every dollar that you spend in license fees three to one. So every every dollar that you spend is seventy five bucks, or every twenty five dollars for your hunting license, seventy five dollars for the department to operate. That's how we do all of our surveys. There are some additional appropriations through the state general fund, but by and large, the bulk of what we do is Pittman Robertson funding. No, we have not. We have not had to go there. I've been I've been approached several times, and Wild Sheep Foundation's been really generous. Um, a couple other NGOs have been great, and my my answer is, you know, guys, right now there are other places that need it worse. You know, I'm I'm really fortunate because we're in pretty good shape in Alaska. My colleagues in New Mexico, and and other places, if if their tag doesn't sell at the governor's tag auction, those guys aren't doing research. You know, we're we're we have the benefit of consistent funding, and it's it's really nice to be able to build a project and know that you can maintain your research for five years you know it's basically i write the proposal and they say how long are you going to run this and i say well i think we need this much data and they're like okay good to go so that's a it's a real real advantage we've got so <clears throat> okay uh, again nothing in the disease front in 14c we had a couple of ex couple of animals were exposed to some minor viral players uh, I'm not going to go down that road right now. We can talk about it afterwards if you'd like, but I'll just kind of keep moving on. <clears throat> so again, these animals were fairly skinny, not as bad as 13D and a little bit bigger. But again, nobody was carrying any sub-Q fat, and the muscle tone was, or the, the muscle load or muscle uh, reserves were getting down there. Again, in direct comparison to what Steve observed in the Brooks and the Alaska Ranges. Go ahead. The next thing we noticed, and again, this was the winter of 2011-2012. We started this project. We had a really low pregnancy rate, 43%. This was the second lowest pregnancy rate I've ever seen reported in an ungulate population anywhere. Um, <laughs> so they're both right here. We're famous. Um, bumped up a little bit last spring <clears throat> to 94%. Again, I think there's a bit of a rebound effect there. John? Were Arthur's studies about the same time of year that you same time of year, but different years. Yeah. Um, so he's, yeah, yeah. He was catching animals in late, late winter. Um, we're, we run up against a bit of a bind. You know, we want to get late enough so we've got daylight to work, uh, but not so late in the year that we're stressing, overly stressing pregnant animals. So we're, that late March window is, is when we tend to operate. Okay, go ahead, Brian. <clears throat> So once we get the collars on, what do we do with them? Well, we spend a lot of super, a lot of super cub time. Uh, go ahead. <clears throat> we try to fly these guys twice a month. Um, <clears throat> every time we try to get a visual on the animal, record the location. I refer to it as a poor man's GPS collar, um, but it gets me out in the field. Thank you. So this is what we're hearing. Um, if that animal's active, there's a little switch in the collar. If the animal's active at least once in any uh, four-hour period, that switch is flipped, and then we're getting 60 beats a minute. So we hear that, we track in on it, we know the animal's alive. If that animal doesn't move for four hours, it goes up to 90 beats a minute. We call it a mortality signal. Um, <clears throat> on the lambs, it's, it happens after an hour. On the adults, it happens after four hours. When that happens, that's our cue that to get in there and investigate and see what we can find. Typically, we'll go in by helicopter, although we have walked into a couple. Uh, go ahead. <clears throat> Mortality. Brian had asked about trying to figure out what killed him. So far, it's been fairly straightforward with a couple of exceptions. Uh, go back one, please. <clears throat> in a lot of cases, this is what we get. Uh, a little bit of white hair, some wolf tracks, some wolf scat, and a set of horns, something like that. Uh, next slide. Or we'll find a bloody collar. Uh, these are all pretty good pretty good indicators of what happened. Next slide. Other times it's really easy to diagnose what happened, but really, really hard to get to. <laughs> we did this on the first year of the project exactly once. Um, after, four hours, after four hours of digging, we could have put a VW bug in that hole, and we quit, and it came back in September. Um, <laughs> so at this point, if we get one in an avalanche debris pile, we come in, we get out of the helicopter, it's like, bing, 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 hold the antenna down over it. Yeah, the radio signal's coming out of the debris pile. Okay, I think we're good there. Um, we'll come back. I'll come back and verify it late in the year, but I'm, I'm no longer digging. <clears throat> Other times, it's not so easy. We find something like this, that's a, that's, a, that's a cue to bring in the experts. Go ahead. 
<clears throat> and we're really fortunate. We've got a great veterinary pathologist here in Eagle River. This is Dr. Kathy Burek. Uh, you guys know her. She's awesome. Um, I've learned more about wildlife disease from sitting in with Kathy on necropsies than I ever did in college or grad school. It's been really, really educational. She lives right up here off Eagle River Road. And the advantage to working on the road system is that a lot of times we can throw a couple of slings on the animal's hooves, lift it on a long line, and drop it right in the back of the truck. I don't even have to touch it. I back it up in Kathy's garage, and she goes to work, and I just kind of sit there and watch and learn. Uh, but I put this slide in to indicate that in most cases, we're actually getting a really high-level veterinary pathologist opinion on what happened to these animals. It's not just me out there going, hmm, let's see, hacking and slashing. So <clears throat> I'm fairly comfortable attributing the... Uh, the mortalities that aren't easily attributable to what, what Kathy says it is. And we get a real complete disease workup on that animal. So we had collars on roughly 183 sheep years. So 183 sheep for 183 sheep years of data. Of that, we've had 22 different adult mortalities. That works out to about 12% adult mortality a year, which fits pretty nicely with some of the other studies on ungulates. You lose somewhere between 10 and 15% is in the normal range. This is where it gets interesting. Again, things get a little bit different. Remember how I said that in Steve's project in the Brooks and in the Alaska range, all of his adult mortality was due to predation? <clears throat> Not quite here. Our top, two, our top two sheep killers in the Chugach are avalanches and pneumonia. And by pneumonia, I don't mean I want to draw a real strong distinction between the, the large-scale pneumonia that will wipe out most of a population in the lower 48. These are isolated pneumonia events. In most cases, these animals have a real high parasite load. They're extremely nutritionally stressed, uh, and they're, they're otherwise susceptible. Pneumonia is just the last thing that kills them. We're, in some cases, the list of things wrong with them is, is literally multiple pages on a pathology report. But the, the final cause of death was, was pneumonia. Uh, wolverines are much more effective at killing sheep than we would have ever imagined. Uh, I'll get to that a little bit more. <clears throat> we missed a couple in the winter of 2011. Uh, if you remember that big wind event, uh, February 2011 blew for days and days and days and created some unbelievably scary avalanche conditions. So we weren't really willing to get out of the helicopter on a couple, and we just have to classify those as unknowns. We had one animal that uh, developed some complications during pregnancy. One was killed by a wolf, and then uh, one final ewe was 17 when she finally tipped over, winter 2012. And although she was extremely malnourished and had pneumonia, I'm going to write that one up as age. Her teeth were pretty well gone, and... and uh, I think we can call it, a, call it an old age death. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is just a graphic representation of that data set. Basically, most of these animals are doing pretty well once they make it to adulthood. Go ahead. To look at that little fraction of animals that, uh, that has died, again, 50% of our... Of the animals that have died, 50% were killed by avalanches. Another roughly 20% were killed by pneumonia. You can call that one nutritional stress, but... Um, Pneumonia is kind of the, the end diagnosis. Wolverines, wolves, played a, played a role as well. Okay, go ahead. Change gears a little bit and talk about the first year of data in 14C. And I'll remind you again, please don't draw any big direct or big comparisons between 14 and 13D at this point. We've only got a limited data set, and we're just, uh, just finishing our second year of data collection in 14C. So that first year on the, on the 14C project, we did really well. We lost, uh, lost one ewe in an avalanche up at Peters Creek, and we had one that was killed by a predator um, <clears throat> late, late uh, February 2013, uh, most likely a wolverine, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure, so we're, we're just going to call it a, an unknown predator. And one of our collar rams died. Um, that was a, an unknown but definitely non-predation uh, mortality. Typically, when an animal is killed by a predator, you've got real classic hallmarks. You've got blood on the collar, you've got predator tracks or fecal material, uh, and you've got scattered bones and crushed and broken long bones. This animal was intact. We just didn't get to it in time. Uh, one of those combinations of weather and daylight and aircraft availability and, and, uh, and other stuff. <clears throat> 14C was a very interesting place to be a sheep last spring. Um, the first year of the project went pretty well. We lost 5%. And then between the 1st of April and uh, <clears throat> the date on the header 
reads February 26, 2014. We were able to check the, 20, the 14C sheep two days ago. So this is up-to-date data, up-to-the-minute data. Of those mortalities, of those nine mortalities between April 1st and two days ago, all but one occurred between the 1st of April 2013 and June 15th, 2013. That was last spring. These were all related in some way to that late, cold, wet spring we had. Um, <clears throat> four animals, three animals, the, let, me, let me start over. Of those nine, eight happened last spring. Of those eight, three were avalanches. Wolverine killed one. Brown bear killed one. <clears throat> an unknown predator got one. Um, we lost one to a, a non-predation cause. Again, it was an aged animal, but we got to it, and all the bo long bones were intact, although she was too far gone to, to get to the pathologist. And one animal died during, during birth, and, as the lamb uh, did not clear the birth canal. So that was a pretty, uh, pretty tough time to be a sheep in 14C with that, that late, heavy, wet snow. Our ram mortality almost paralleled the uh, the ewe mortality, real similar trajectory, real similar thing going on there. <clears throat> Lost roughly 20 plus percent of the animals, of our collared animals, last spring. Go ahead. <clears throat> We're going to shift gears a little bit. Stop talking about the adults for a sec. I'll come back to it at the end of the talk. But the next phase of the project is what's happening to those to the lambs. You know, we can't really grow a population if we don't have lambs hitting the ground and surviving. So I put this slide up to uh, to illustrate one thing. We're catching lambs early, as, uh, right, as, right as newborns, we're radio collaring them, often within 48 hours of birth. Um, <clears throat> I will add that I used to think I was pretty darn good in the mountains until I started catching lambs. And uh, <clears throat> I used to think I was really, really pretty fit. And being humbled by a 36-hour 36 36 old lamb is, is really something. Uh, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're amazing little critters. They're about the size of a house cat, but their legs are that long. They're all leg, so they can just go and go and go. So we've got to get them at, right at birth. Um, the reason that this slide is up is to illustrate that these are that the ewes are extremely attentive mothers. Um, we've just collared and released this lamb. We're kind of hiding behind this rock. She'd been standing out there at about 60 yards watching the whole workup. Workup takes about two minutes. Weigh it, put a call on it, whatever. I'll get to that in a sec. The minute we let that lamb go, bing, she was right there, right back there, picked it up and took off. Um, we've done 130 odd lambs and we've had one abandonment. If you've been to the Alaska Zoo, you've met her. Um, she's the, the new little lamb in there. Um, but I'm pretty comfortable. I'm pretty comfortable with this data collection. We're not seeing the abandonment that I was very, very concerned we'd see when we started the project. So we started slow and kind of worked into it. Um, go ahead, Brian. And uh, the second video, I'll give you a little bit better picture of what's going on here. And uh, <clears throat> so we've gotten up and flown the collared ewes from a cub, and when we, uh, when we observe a, a ewe that we know is pregnant from our pregnancy test, we'll bring the helicopter in, get on the ground as close to as we can, and go from there. They pick some pretty interesting spots to lamb. So if you look closely, right at the top of that little gully, there's a, there's a ewe and a lamb up there. This... Uh, I don't know if you guys know Corey Stantor. If he grew up in Chugiak or Eagle River, I think he went to school here. He's one of our wildlife technicians. This was Corey brought his GoPro with a with a head mount and filmed this. So very grateful to him for this this footage. <clears throat> One of the really nice things about being the project lead is you can kind of hang back. Oh, no, you go get the experience on this one. So. <laughs> yes. 
Um, we've got weights. I've got to, I've got to actually compare neonate weights to Steve's data set. That's part of my analysis that I'll be doing as, as the project wraps up. I have not done the analysis yet. It's a really good point. I expect we'll see some difference. And go ahead, John. Assuming there's a lot less stress on the situation when you're on the ground like this, you take off. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, the first year on the project, I was really interested. I've mentioned abandonment. I was really interested to see what, uh, <clears throat> how, how the U's were going to react. I just carried a laser rangefinder with me, and in about 75% of the cases, they went 100 yards or less. They just head up into the rocks and kind of watch, and then as soon as we were able to release the, uh, release the lamb after collaring it, they would, uh, they'd move right back in and pick it up. No, I'll get to that. Yeah, these are. This is a pretty neat little piece of technology. <clears throat> we can uh, we can end this here. We're just gonna we're just gonna do a quick wait and check and see what uh, what sex it is, and then and then uh, in the interests of moving along, I'll I'll end it here. But uh, <clears throat> so lamb captures again. These are photos just to end, just to illustrate. If the video didn't work, we'll put the helicopter in as close as we can. This is over by Taslina Lake approach on foot in most cases, the U will let us get within just a couple of yards before she boogies. Grab the lamb, go ahead, slip, weigh it real fast, slip a collar on it, and uh, you had a great question about the, who was that? Great question about the collars. Okay, so these lamb collars are basically an ace bandage with a radio, uh, with a radio, VHF radio riveted to it. Um, the other really cool thing is that they're bar tacked. When I pass this around, look at this, the collar material itself is stretchy. The first bar tack has two lines of stitching, the second one has four, and the third one has a whole bunch. So they come apart sequentially. The thread is actually supposedly UV sensitive. The design life on these is 12 months. Reality, they last about 18. But uh, ultimately, they go from this to this, and they just fall off the animal. So there's no chance of it wearing it into eternity. Uh, the first year on the project, we got to May. Design life on the collars was a year. I'm like, hmm, well, this is concerning. Got to July, the animals were 14 months old. I'm like, well, nothing's come off yet. Got to October, nothing had come off. And we actually brought the helicopter in, and we went out and caught half a dozen of them just to, just to check. Every single collar had holes in it. It was like minutes from coming apart. Um, so they've all, they've all performed really, really well. I'll pass these around, but you can check out the, check out the bar tacks and, and uh, the, the, used, the used model as well. So once we get the collars on these guys, the big goal is to figure out what happens to them. Um, we'll fly pretty much every day between the 15th of May and the 15th of June. You see a real big spike in mortality that first month of life, and after that they do pretty well. <clears throat> after about the middle of June, we'll ramp the flights back to twice a week. Uh, from the 1st of July through the 1st of hunting season, we're in the air once a week. Totally cease flying during hunting season and then get back into it after the 1st of October. Again, when a mortality is detected, we'll get in there in a helicopter or on foot as quickly as possible. Go ahead. Nice thing about white sheep is that blood stains show up fairly well. Uh, so it's, again, predation is easy to diagnose. This was a guy that had an extremely high lungworm load and, uh, and died of lungworm-related pneumonia. Go ahead. Uh, eagles are, in fact, a major predator on, on lambs. Eagles are characteristic because they tend to leave the spine and long bones intact. Other stuff, coyotes, wolverines, wolves will break the long bones. Bears will, won't leave you much at all. But eagles are, eagles are pretty, uh, <clears throat> pretty easy to diagnose because, A, you've got eagle poop and feathers, and, B, most of the long bones are, are intact. Next slide. Uh, another look at an eagle kill site. Big pile of eagle scat right here in the foreground. Go ahead. Brown bears will kind of skin them out. Um, the guys that have worked caribou calves, I think the pattern is very much the, very much the same. You just get a, a hoof or two and a patch of hide, and, and that's about it. <clears throat> piece of bear, piece of bear scat to make diagnosis easy. Go ahead. Uh, this is a wolverine kill. Occasional long bones, and uh, wolverines are pretty effective on on sheep, both adults and lambs, given the right conditions. Most of the time, we see this in a situation where you've got a fairly hard wind slab. Um, you'll have a couple weeks of heavy wind, hammers that snow down real hard. You and I'd punch through it. Sheep, narrow little hooves, punch through it. Wolverines, not so much. They stay right on top. I've seen several instances where you see post holes. The sheep is post holing little wolverine claw marks right up to the grease spot. So again, fairly easy to fairly easy to tell what's going on. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes it's not a predator. Uh, they try to cross swollen streams in the spring and get swept away. Here's one that got picked up in a log jam. Go ahead. 
rock slides do a number. <clears throat> and uh, this is, notice the date on the ruler here. This is January 26, 2010. I put this slide in uh, just to illustrate one thing, that bone marrow is typically white and buttery. It looks kind of like Crisco or, or margarine or something like that. When, when bone marrow starts to, when an animal is nutritionally stressed, the bone marrow becomes increasingly more pinkish and pinkish and pinkish. The strawberry jam color that you see here is a hallmark of an animal that starved to death. This is a, this is a freebie as far as diagnosis goes. You see a long bone that's got that, uh, that strawberry jam in there. You, you can pretty much call that one right then, right then and there. <clears throat> so our lamb survival has been really variable in the 13D project. It bounces all over the map. Uh, the first year of the project, we had 42% survive. I was like, okay, that's, that's reasonable. We can build a sheep population on this. That's, that's good. The next two years, we took a huge, huge hit. Uh, 2010 lambs went through that wind event in February of 2011 that was uh, concurrent with the 2011 Board of Game meeting in Wasilla. Mike Meekin and I took off from his place one morning to go monitor sheep in 13D. We're going up the Matanuska, and Mike goes, I think my GPS is broken. And um, I look down, and we're not moving. And he's like, I'm showing we're making six miles an hour. <laughs> so anyway, we turned around. Um, <clears throat> it was blowing pretty hard that morning. I've never gone backwards. Anybody gone backwards? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, 2011 lambs did a little bit better, but again, lamb survival, lamb survival rates in the low double digits are, are problematic. And then 2012, we did, we did quite a bit better. I'm not quite sure what the, what the difference is. The point is, it's, it's, very, it's extremely variable. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of data at you guys in the next four slides. The take-home message here, don't really look at the breakdown. Just look at, <clears throat> look at the fact that we have a, a lot of mortality happening early. Eagle kills early in life, nine days, 17 days. Brown bears early, an unknown predator at about two weeks. Starvation, drowning, pneumonia at about a month. And after that, <clears throat> there's a break. They catch a pretty good break from about the oh, 15th of June, 20th of June, all the way to midpoint of maybe November, December. Things start to happen again. Wolf predation in the winter, uh, malnutrition and disease. Mal wintertime malnutrition and avalanche kills start to show up in late winter. Uh, <clears throat> this pattern, I'll show you the next several slides. This was our 2010 lambs. Go ahead to 20, the next, or 29, 2009. 2010 is much the same way. Eagles early, um, <clears throat> falls, drowning, starvation, pneumonia early. And then, uh, and then late, had one instance where we found three lambs killed by a brown bear and one drainage within about a mile and a half of each other. And I think this one pretty much figured it out. They just got above it, ran it down into the alders, and, uh, and that, was, that was that. But there is really a pattern. You get about half your lamb mortality early, and about half your lamb mortality late. So <clears throat> avalanches again, 9, 10, 11 months. Go ahead, Brian. Same kind of pattern peeking up here. Black bears made an appearance. A uh, couple of rock slides and our first coyote mortality at about six months on uh, one of our 2011 born lambs. Go ahead. <coughs> we had a fairly small sample size of lambs born in 2012 as a result of that low pregnancy rate. We managed to get collars on, on 11 animals. Um, the ones that we did collar did pretty well. We lost four out of 11. But again, that pattern holds. Early mortality, some predation, some accidents, uh, some drowning, some disease, and then late mortality, starvation, avalanches, bigger predators late in the winter. Go ahead. So over the last five years, we've managed to monitor 77 total lambs over the course of the project. Uh, again, lamb survival was, was variable year to year, but the pattern tends to hold. About half our mortality, <clears throat> about a third survive, about a third are killed by predators, and about a third are lost to non-predation causes. So predation and non-predation is, is almost equal. Uh, we didn't manage to recover a handful, mostly due to high avalanche danger. Go ahead. The graphic representation of that same data set. Just an idea, just give you an idea of, of how the pictures work out. Again, a third, a third, and a third. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. Not trying to make anybody motion sick here, but this is just to illustrate the number and variety of causes that, uh, that kill lambs. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons that I don't think predator control on sheep would be effective. We lose a small fraction of our lambs to several different predators, and you know, even if we were to completely wipe out the entire effects of one class of predators, we'd only, re at best, realize maybe a 9% a increase in, uh, in lamb survival. <clears throat> Go ahead. 
14C, again, one year of data. Um, we run our lamb analyses from May through the following May. So lambs born in 2012, we've completed. I have not yet completed data collection on those lambs that were collared in May of 2013. But 61% uh, lamb survival on that first, that first cohort of lambs. We lost a few more to predators, although there is a mitigating factor I'll discuss in a second uh, in, that, in that data point. And uh, <clears throat> we had a few loss to non-predation causes, uh, one avalanche and one drowning. We lost six. We lost six lambs to eagles. Four of those. Uh, four of those six were all in Goat Creek, and we started the project and we got pretty excited. We were being really successful putting collars out. Put a bunch of collars out in Goat Creek, and boom, boom, boom. Had I think had four lamb mortalities in there in like the first week or ten days of the project. So that just illustrates why it's really important to get your collars all evenly distributed across the study area. We'll include this in the data set. I'm not going to remove it. But it is, it is something that might con confound our analyses if we were looking at just one year of data. So this is a good reason why we don't want to draw any comparisons between what we've seen in 13D and what we've seen in 14C. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to wrap things up, talk about some other studies very briefly, and do some comparisons. And we'll kind of finalize and then move on to some where we're going in the future. Again, adult survival rate on this project is 87.5%, 88%. Very, very comparable to what Steve measured in the Alaska Range and the Brooks. Um, where it gets pretty interesting is when you start looking at the predation fractions. We're seeing roughly 16% of our adult mortality due to predation, 84% um, to mostly avalanches and disease, other stuff. But again, the Alaskan brooks, all of the animals that died were killed by predators. Go ahead. This is a slide that Steve sent me just a couple of days ago, and this just shows you kind of, the, kind of that breakdown just by picture. Again, his Alaska Range project. Um, <clears throat> The purple is a fraction of sheep killed by, by non-predation non causes, and we're up there in the, the high to mid-80s. Uh, <clears throat> and, and you can see the direct contrast there between the Central Alaska Range Study and the, the Brooks. Go ahead. <clears throat> Lamb survival overall rates are very similar, the Brooks and the Alaska Range, but when you get into causes, things differ again. We only lost uh, we lo less than... Let's see. Less than half of our lamb mortality was killed by predators. It was, uh, was due to predation. Only 25 out of 56. And again, you're talking 90, 70 to 90 percent in Steve's other projects. So this is a, a, real, a real divergence. Go ahead. And again, just a, a real difference. We're seeing somewhat lower uh, lamb survival and somewhat higher, uh, somewhat higher rates of lambs killed by, by accidents and, and non-predation causes than in those projects. Go ahead. And this just uh, is another slide, courtesy of Steve, but looking at the breakdown of, uh, of the effects of different predators on, on lamb crops. Uh, coyotes and eagles are the big players in the central Alaska range. Uh, eagles and wolverines in the brooks in the Chugach. So just a, <clears throat> the, the take-home message there is that it, things are going to be different in different mountain ranges. Go ahead. So to wrap things up, uh, 13D, I think we're pretty confident that predation is not playing a major role. We see a low percentage of animals lost to predators and a very broad distribution across predator species. I don't think predators are playing much of a role in 13D. <clears throat> I think we can totally and completely rule out disease, which as far as, as far as I can see is a really, really good piece of news. We don't have disease. Disease is not having a population level effect in South Central Alaska sheep. I think we lose some individual animals to it, especially when they're potentially nutritionally stressed, but in the big picture, it's not, uh, it's not a major factor. <clears throat> Pregnancy rates are, are really, really low, which suggests very strongly a nutrition or a habitat or a weather issue. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead. So I think with that, we're going to start wrapping up the 13D project this year, uh, start asking some more targeted questions. I'd like to finish the analysis. I want to look at individual reproductive histories on those 13DUs. Remember, we caught as many of those animals as we could every year. So we'll be able to tell if they're getting pregnant, taking a year off, getting pregnant, taking a year off, and building up nutritional reserves, or if they're going and going and going and going. <clears throat> I'd still like to be able to look at winter weather and uh, snow and ice buildup, try to see if we're actually losing winter habitat due to either snow hardness or, uh, or winter weather or ice formation as a result of some of these, what, 50-degree days we've been having. 
Um, <clears throat> so we're going to look at long-term temperature records and some historical satellite imagery. The other thing I've got is a bunch of blood samples in the freezer that we'll send off for trace mineral levels, kind of get a look at whether there's a, a potential mineral deficiency that might be able to be corrected somehow. <clears throat> Go ahead. 14C, again, we're looking at just one year of data. But again, predation is, is a much lower player or much smaller player in 14C than it is in 13D. Uh, <clears throat> one of the real interesting point to me is that RAM death rates at this point appear to mirror new death rates. I had expected that they'd be quite a bit lower. So that's kind of something that I want to follow up on a little bit further. And the low pregnancy rates in 2012 obviously were, were mirrored in 13D, probably as a result of that real hard winter. Um, <clears throat> again, 94% pregnancy rate this last spring, that was good news. But uh, this last winter was good news, but that was counteracted by that uh, that wet, heavy spring snow, and we weren't able to get a lot of collars on, on lambs. <clears throat> the project was, 14C was intended as a two-year uh, two standalone study, but because of that last, uh, because of the last spring's weather conditions, <clears throat> I think we're going to try to shoot for at least one, one extra year of work in the 2014 to 2015 project year. Excuse me. Yeah. I'll start that next week. <clears throat> and hope to get pregnancy rates and uh, get enough collars on lambs to get a meaningful measure of lamb survival going forward. Go ahead. <clears throat> Ultimately, if we can identify a couple of things, uh, either similarities or differences between the 14C and 13D chew gash, that will give us quite a bit of insight whether weather, predation, and habitat are similar between the two study areas. Finally, can we use this data to manage sheep all the way across South Central, or do we need to start looking at some other options in different areas? Finally, um, I'd like to start gathering some information on ram movement, dispersal, distribution, and survival rates, perhaps with a view to asking some questions about what full curl harvest means and, and, uh, and what, what that looks like in the face of some of our sheep populations after the, the 30 to 50 percent decline we've seen. Go ahead. So to, to that end, um, we started collaring. We started using some of these lambs that we caught. We know exactly when they were born. Um, these guys, we have a birthday on them. We collar them as newborns. <clears throat> so when they get to be 18 months old, we catch them. We put an adult collar on them, put a GPS collar on them, like that one that I handed around. Give us rates and causes of mortality all the way through their life. We get a look at that. Um, see where they're going, what they're doing. Are these guys homebodies, or do they take off? Do we have sheep going from, from Eagle River to the Arm, or Eklutna to Eagle River, or something like that? Uh, <clears throat> so as of, as of at this point, we've got roughly a dozen lambs that were born in spring of 2012 that we fitted with adult collars last fall, and they're our first candidates. I'm hoping for good lamb survival from the 2013 crop next fall to, to bulk up that sample size. The other, uh, the other real cool thing I'm, I'm excited to get so we all know that the department can't age sheep. Uh, <clears throat> so ideally, with known age rams, we're going to be able to say, hey, this guy was born in May of 2012. Here it is, 2021. If a hunter, if a hunter harvests him and brings him in, we'll have a, a very extensive, we'll be able to get a very extensive set of pictures on that. If, um, if he dies, we'll be able to get a... Uh, Pick those, pick those horns up and use those as a teaching tool. You can say, hey, this guy's nine years old, or this guy's six years old, and okay, here's, here's where this annuli was formed. You know, we caught him here. He had this, this kind of horn measurements, this size base, had this many annuli. We can actually correlate how many annuli are there with, with what's out there. So it would be a good teaching tool on both sides. Uh, <clears throat> and to that end, go ahead. So here's a, here's a I'm going to have some fun with this. Uh, here's a... Uh, Here's a sheep that we caught this fall, and try to age him just for fun. <laughs> this is an 18-month-old ram. He was born in uh, he was born in May of 2012. That's that's a lamb tip right there. And uh, <clears throat> so maybe maybe one of our Kids will pull a Chugach tag in 2021 or something and be able to find this guy. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we can go ahead and here's another one. This guy, this guy turned up in uh, in the 14C Chugach in, in May of 2012, and he's a little bit harder to age. But take a shot at that. <laughs> That's a legal sheep, guys. That's a legal sheep. So it's all over the map. I just I just put these up to have some fun. I, uh, 
Anyway, guys, that's that's all I've got. Go to the next slide if you would. Chuck. Hey, I noticed you guys take off the ending sample just on the Rams from 14C. No, we've been actually um, – there's a woman named Gretchen Roffler, and Gretchen was just picked up by ADF and G. She's going to be a predator-prey biologist down in southeast out of our Juno Douglas office. Gretchen's been doing some really, really neat work on sheep genetics statewide. So we collected a bunch of samples this fall for her work um, that is going to be a fish and game project I'm very excited about. But all, she's actually looking at a whole bunch of different things having to do with sheep genetics, uh, looking at disease resistance, um, looking at dispersal rates, looking at how much how much movement is there between sheep populations. But we pulled we pulled genetic samples from everything we sealed in Anchorage this year. Uh, we got a hundred plus samples and that'll be used to build that data set for. So Bob Are we going to send anybody to the Oh we are all going. Um, there's gosh, Todd are you are you going? I, okay. I think uh, Becky and Todd, Becky from Glen Allen, Todd's going out of Palmer, I'm going, who are the other? Delta, oh, uh, good, uh, Darren Bruning out of Delta, and Tony, right, Cavalock? Yeah, so yeah, we'll be there. And I was actually, I missed I missed Wild Sheep in Reno this year because I was deciding to go to, uh, go to the Finhorn Conference in Vancouver, and we'll also be hopefully sending a very big presence to the research meetings in Fort Collins and Northern Wild Sheep and Goat meetings in uh, in June. So one more slide. Ah, cool. Thanks. Um, as I mentioned, this is not just me. I get to stand up here and talk about it, and it's lots of fun. But everybody everybody here on this slide contributed very, very generously to the project. Um, and I, I do want to single them out. So thanks for sitting through the whole talk, and thanks for sitting through this next couple minutes. But uh, Mike Harrington has saved my life on at least two occasions. Mike is that voice of reason in the back of your head that says, this is not a good idea. Do not do that. Um, <clears throat> Becky, Tony, biologist Becky, Tony, Thomas McDonough, Chris Brockman, um, awesome, awesome help doing captures. Hey, why don't you do it this way? You know, this would be a heck of a lot more efficient if you did that. Try this analysis. Think about this. Have you thought about that? Guys, I really appreciate it. Uh, wildlife technicians Kyle Smith and Corey Stantorf, always there, always willing to get in the cub and Go, go fly on a moment's notice and collect data when something else came up. Uh, graduate student Brianne Winter, Brianne Bowen. Brianne got married and then got pregnant. I was really hoping to hire her, but her husband refuses to move to Alaska. Um, <clears throat> so Brianne is completing her master's at University of Nevada, Reno. And I'm really, really sorry to lose her. But that'll be a very interesting piece of, of data looking at the demographics in 14C and then some other other blood chemistry parameters that go along with it. Aircraft support, Mike Meekin, Mike Litson, Matt Keller, uh, local guys that you all probably know or know of. Awesome fixed-wing pilots, and we couldn't have done it without them. Helicopter drivers, Mark Shelton, David Rivers from Quicksilver and Fairbanks. Uh, these guys are the absolute top of the heap. There's nobody better than Quicksilver. Uh, I do a lot of my own capture work, mostly because it's more efficient than bringing them down. But if it was all about getting collars out, Quicksilver is the name of the game. Uh, pilots Tommy Levanger, Chris Jordan from Pollock up in, uh, <clears throat> up in Wasilla. We all, we all learned together, and it was really, really rewarding training each other. Troy Cambier, uh, Chena River Aviation out of Fairbanks, and Joe Fieldman with... Uh, with Saloy Aviation out of Wasilla. These guys are amazing, amazing rotor pilots. And it's just been it's been a great, a great time working with all of them. Thank you guys for coming, making the time. It's been holy cow, hour and twenty. I didn't think I was gonna go this long. Thanks for sitting still through it. Appreciate it. Um, we'll stick around and ask questions or I'll just I'll just open the floor up if you guys have any.